this office, but even though we had a chance to when you first came in, but haven't answered any questions. What I did, and I did this last year too with you all, at the end of the year, I kind of looked at what 2000, that time 14 was. Um, so I'd like to take a couple minutes, talk a little bit about 2015, what I foresee coming up in 2016, um, but then also open it up for questions as well. When I look at 2015, I um, was really pleased in a number of areas that, and I think Democrats and Republicans came together. If I look at some of the top uh, accomplishments from my perspective, and I'll dig into each of them a little bit, was one, Montana continues to actually be the most fiscally prudent or one of the most fiscally prudent states in the country, where you have so many challenges in other states where, like if you're in Kansas, they shut down their school year early. If you're in Illinois, they're not even paying lottery tickets. Montana continues to keep $300 million in the bank. We're moving things forward, and that allows us to do some other things, like reduce interest rates, local governments pay for infrastructure. I pleased that you know we end this year at 4.1 percent unemployment rate um, about a point below the national average more people working in the state of montana than ever before and our wage as far as increase you know wage growth is among the top in the nation I think we're sixth over the last few years when it goes to increases in wages pleased um, that i think that we've made smart investments in our public education system, and we're seeing you know, incredible results from highest graduation rates um, since ever has been recorded since we started keeping that, to freezing college tuition, making some meaningful target investments in higher ed, which makes a significant difference. And please, that you know, I think the last time we spoke was mostly about the legislative session. It's hard not to look at 2015 without the legislative session being a part of it. But as we close out the year, you know, we <clears throat> can not only reflect on our legislative results, but also things like now that I think we're up to 17,000 Montanans have already signed up to get health care uh, through the Health Act, which we got the waiver about a month ago. And those individuals will also be tied in because it really is a unique program that we end up putting together. But those individuals will also end up uh, coming together with our job services and trying to find ways to make sure that those working Montanans can be upskilled, get you know, even in a better employment position. It carries over into 2016 in as much as that many of those same things that we've been working on will continue to do so. And I know that there's also some viewed specific issues and other things, but um, one thing is that to continue sort of the strength of our economy and increasing wages, um, I think there are a number of steps that we are taking. I look at this time, this past legislative session is the first time that we've invested state dollars meaningfully invested into research at our university system, but it's not just research that we hope that someday it might um, turn into something. It's research dealing with both Montana problems. It had to have a nexus to existing private sector businesses, and also with the hope that we actually see some results out of this in a two-year period. For uh, grants and programs in Butte, and Missoula and Bozeman and Billings and Haver as well from that. As we look at increasing wages, that it's something that I started shortly after um, getting elected, that, and we're still working on it. You know, the fact that women make 74 cents on the dollar uh, as men do in Montana, that when working families are doing better, everyone's doing better. Now we've taken some non legislative steps. Um, and we'll continue to, to, we tried some legislative steps and we were unsuccessful this last session with things that we'll continue to work on. The skill of our workforce is significant both for wages and for the needs that we know coming up into the future. 
is that I can look out over the next decade and there's a real need for skilled workers. And certainly we already hear it in many corners of the state of Montana, but from we're taking steps already to address it in many ways, like in well in advanced manufacturing. We've brought the private sector together, government and the educational system. It's not always about another degree. At times it's about getting an industry recognized credentials. Through the Rev Up program, we have about 13,000 students now that are a part of that. And they're not all the college students. There are some folks that are um, you know, currently working, but just we're bringing them back for additional skills. I think that continuing to do some pushes in STEM are significant. On the front page of your paper today was the Hour of Code, but we're also doing some meaningful things with um, Montana is one of six states that recently received a grant to get people <coughs> on the job experience in the STEM fields. We also succeeded this session in getting a college scholarship set up just for STEM. And I think that we need to continue to push in many areas in our traditional industries as well. In the last three years, on average, um, we've mined more coal in the state of Montana than the, since the 1980s. We're about at the average of, and uh, Tim has some, some charts of that, we're at about the average of oil production as well. I mean, our each year of our three years compared to the last 35. And we're doing a lot of work on our timber infrastructure as well. We've taken state dollars and put them into federal and private and tribal projects, which right now, um, you know, the estimate is about creating, in what is really a global market, um, creating a, or retaining about a thousand jobs. It's treating 200,000 acres. <clears throat> and it's also, um, I think it's a, these projects in the pipeline now. These are, one of them, 14 of them are federal, but it has about 60 million board feet in the pipeline. Those are some of the ways I think that we keep our economy going. Education, we've made great steps in dual enrollment high school kids taking college courses. Mm -hmm. And we all, we're also seeing the results with kind of the, it's not just for the highest achievers. Um, when we double of that again by the time we're in 2017 and continue to make targeted meaningful investments in education. And then I think that the rest of the legislative pieces will certainly roll out, but um, we know both as we implement sage grouse and as we implement uh, the Health Act, that there's going to be a lot of work to do that can make a meaningful difference in people's lives. So that's kind of some of the things that I see from the past and also going forward, but I'm happy to answer just about any question you might have. You got, um, we, you talked about the unemployment rate, 4.1%, which, which sounds pretty good. I, I know there's some hot spots in the state that where it's significantly higher. And, one that we seem to hear a lot about from the the federal lands management and timber side of things is uh, you know Mineral County and in that area of the state. Is there is there any plans or anything that uh, you're doing to try to address some of the enclaves of high unemployment in the state? Well, I think yeah. In I mean, it briefly glossed on the timber management practices. I mean, it's something that even before we nominated the 5.1 million acres under Farm Bill authorities that we're working on and saying that I'll bring state dollars to the table if it can move the needle on federal lands. This is about logs on trucks and infrastructure, but it's also about um, watershed protection and better forest management. And it is exciting in as much as that 50 to 60 million board feet isn't going to solve all the problems, but it's moving things in the right direction. And it's also um, a piece where, you know, I mean, we've literally more or less embedded, if you will, 
state employees into the Forest Service. And we were the first state in the country to so sign an overall statewide stewardship contract where we can bring state resources at times to get some of the return. I mean, a lot of the work that we're doing, uh, 10 Mile Watershed, is based on that. If you look at Region 1, where we are, this is just on the federal lands. I mean, there's actually more federal money came here in part because I've said, and we've sat down with the regional foresters, like, we're willing to put money, we'll take state money, this will help move things forward. I think that part is helpful. I think other enclaves of significant unemployment are often within our Indian nations. And we really have, that's much of it's through the Main Street Montana project, but really, I mean, we've tried to bring together both the tribal colleges, the tribal governments, and tribal business and say, how can we take advanced steps? Like I think it was this year actually was the first time ever that tribal colleges all came to the overall Board of Education and secured 500,000, I think it's about $500,000 grant to say, we're gonna build tribal college apprenticeship programs. We've had our first success, <coughs> out of, I think it's called the Indian Equity Fund where often financing is difficult in um, Indian country on, our, on reservations. So $500,000 revolving pot of money that'll help secure financing for native owned businesses on reservation. Um, those are some of the areas certainly that we're pushing to target on, some of the real high unemployment areas. Now that doesn't mean that whether you're in Mineral County, whether you're in Lincoln County, or in the counties where um, we're having continued you know, challenges uh, in Indian country. That doesn't mean everything's great. And you can have a below full employment in Yellowstone County as an example. Um, but it doesn't mean folks aren't hurting in some places. Right. Yeah. So you have a big job ahead of you picking out the new lieutenant governor. So how are you feeling with that process as you move forward? Yeah, it's, it's uh, busy at it. Um, in as much as in, in what I task most of my senior staff to say, I want you to reach out to people uh, from business leaders to people involved in politics to community leaders and give us names. And who do you think would be a good fit? And there's a number of facets for this, right? Number one is secession. God forbid that anything happens, continuity of government. Um, working with this team and moving my priorities forward. Hoping to have that all wrapped up by the end of the year. And um, kind of the process is, is we're gathering names, reaching out to some folks that would you at all be interested in even being considered. So you might imagine, like on the one hand, well, everyone <coughs> might be humbled to ask, but a whole lot of them are like, <laughs> why, why would I want to do that? Um, and then I'll sit down and talk to people and move forward from there. What, what are you looking for in Lieutenant Governor? I mean, I, I, I guess I'd like to hear some words about your philosophy of how that job ought to be done. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are challenges with what this job is, no matter what. I mean, some folks have said, well, let's, let's go to Colorado. Like the Lieutenant Governor recently left to become the head of WICHE. Uh, he was the head of, effectively, the head of higher education as lieutenant governor. And there are some lieutenant governors that serve as the heads of cabinet positions. In Montana, we can't do that. I mean, our constitution basically says, you know, can serve in no other public office and a cabinet, other cabinet position would certainly be um, viewed as that. So what I'm looking for is a, being able to fulfill first the constitutional mandate that if God forbid something does happen to me that could step in and assume this role. Now, I assume that everybody that's got to sit in fortune enough to, you know, 24th governor, like when they come in, even if they think they're fully qualified, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that comes in this desk that I'm not sure anybody can always be fully qualified to do this but then also to work on our initiatives and work as 
part of the overall team as we try to advance the state. So there's a difference in who defines what the initiatives are, or, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I, I'm still curious to know how things broke down so severely with you and, and Lieutenant Governor McLean. I know uh, one source told me that she had come to that person a few months ago asking uh, advice on how to manage a, a, a difficult situation, primarily with your staff. And the advice was cultivate a personal relationship with the governor. So I'm curious to know, do you feel that effort was made? Uh, and what advice followed? And whether it was or wasn't, why didn't that work? Why did you, were you not able to have a, a good personal relationship? Yeah, I think that, you know, and it's certainly had, it's been reported about quite a bit this week and even sat down some with Holly this week as well, um, that in many respects, it wasn't that good a fit. Now that doesn't, she's a very capable person. I think she'll do well, but I think it was this kind of ground that's been covered. Well, I'm, I'm looking for more. I mean, I guess I'm just curious to know what, where did it break down? Where do you see it really, uh, where did the relationship break down? I think that, you know, it reported out and had good conversations and you can read the articles and as much as in some respects this happens often in business and other places and, you know, that's ground that I think we plowed. <clears throat> there, there's a gap there. There's obviously a, a gap between her... Uh, account of what, what took place and the fact that you felt her frustration was disruptive. I mean, there's, there's, there's something else there. And I guess I'd love to know from your perspective what it was. I mean, what did you have in mind when you selected her? Why did you pick, why did you pick uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor McClain? You know, for many of the same skills that she has, I think can be very effective in education helping things along there. Anyone else? So, I'm, I'm interested with the, uh, you, were, you talked about the record production of coal, uh, and we're also going into the uh, EPA's Clean Air Act. The Clean Power Plant, sure. Yeah, uh, potentially looking at shutting down coal strip one and two, which isn't directly related to coal production, but ties in in some aspects there, uh, or the coal strip one sure. and two. Yeah, uh, what, what's your thoughts on the clean air and how are we gonna get there and yeah. whether there are other things that we need to be doing? Yeah. You know, when the draft rules came out, um, I think we brought people together, we put together a white paper that said that we can meet the standards proposed and we can do some incredible things and it wouldn't impact coal strip, but with renewables, with energy conservation and other things. Final rule comes out and I was disappointed in the final rule because in many respects, I think it's unfair to the state of Montana. I mean, also we have the largest jumps of any state in the country, but uh, 27 states, are suing on this rule, including the state of Montana. I support that litigation going forward. But I'm also not going to just say, all right, well, I'm not going to do anything because if we don't do something, ultimately then, not unlike Sage Grouse, in some respects, the federal government would actually say, this is the plan for Montana. I'd much rather have it designed by Montanans than elsewhere. Now, with that said, a couple different things, too, I guess. One is, um, I, coal will be part of our energy future. I mean, and we also have 28% of the nation's coal reserves in the state of Montana. Even under the Clean Power Plan, you know, 2030, it goes from 40% coal to 30% coal as far as energy production. Uh, the, there are parts of coal strip that are certainly beyond, you know, the owners of coal strip don't work for the governor of Montana.